Hey kids, it's Justin James, and I'm just trying to spend looking at Dreadnoughtus. So finally I found it, it's in Target, and it's super exciting because this is the third of the large, super large solar pods that Jurassic World Legacy have made. And here is the front of the box showing it in water, which is actually important to its life story. I'm going to show you the side of the box, the other side, which is showing it like this. So like, look at, look at this. So when I saw on the Instagram, someone posted they were, they were coming out with a Dreadnoughtus, I was excited and happy and all the things. So, um... I will warn you too that if you notice that the Brachiosaurus came out and then it kind of went away, then the Apatosaurus came out, then it kind of went away, and so this guy's coming out, coming next. So if you don't have an Apatosaurus or a Brachiosaurus, you can find one and get it now before there's more money online. So, one thing to point out with Jurassic now this was discovered in 2005. Let's see, I'm going to have the official scissors of Jurassic James. And if the femur was exposed, Very sharp blades. So, okay. I miss a part. So the other sauropods, the Brachiosaurus and the Apatosaurus, all came with, um, I think, like, you know, the body and the neck, like that. Uh, actually, the Brachiosaurus, yeah, the tail was separate, the neck was separate, and then the body was separate. Here there's four parts, so the first of them, the largest of them, is the body. Sorry, just the, the thought of, you know, the weight of this animal. The model, I mean. Uh, so, here's the head, and here's the first section of tail, and here's the next section of tail. So, unlike the other Given this line, they have the, the DNA code here you can scan. The other two did not have that. So first I'm going to put in this part of the tail. So essentially you take it and you plug it in like, like that. More force than me, obviously. The next tail, my Godzilla figure has the same tail like this. So you just plug it in, right, with enough force. But not completely, but they were, oh, you turn it sideways. There's a little, there's a square part and square part. But you don't just force it in with, in a fit of rage. Uh, let's see. There it is. I can put it in like that. And then the neck goes, same thing as the tail, plug it in like that. So this thing is like off the screen almost. But the head opens up, the mouth like that. The neck can't, oh, nope, only it doesn't go up or down. And can go side to side like that. Oh, and the whole neck can, can rise up like this. It's still got this, you know, some new toys, so it's kind of tight the thing. The tail can move like that. And rotate like this. Very, very cool. Very neat. That's the, yeah, it's a huge animal. So first of all, what is great now? I, uh, I will say this. Um, first and foremost, something that I, I, I think you should all know is that when I watched the rest of the World Dominion and Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler were flying in to the preserve in Europe, um, he looks at the window and he sees this animal and he goes, oh, Dreadnoughtus. And I remember in the theater going, no. <laughs> um, the idea is that there's no way to have, from a plane, seeing a sauropod like this and knowing exactly its genus because it's a titanosaur. So the idea is that, um, I'm gonna show you more with the actual, with the other two models, but with, with the idea is that titanosaurs First of all, we don't find a lot of them, so and so the idea is they all look very similar for the most part. And I'll tell you why that matters in a minute. But what is a titanosaur? So titanosaurs are actually relatives of the brachiosaur. They are macronarians. And so some of the most famous dinosaurs, well, famous sauropod, lognex, from the Cretaceous period are titanosaurs. So for example, if uh, from Texas, or from, that's from Texas, from, from North America, we have the Alamosaurus, we have Malawi Thoris, we have uh, the one in uh, the Field Museum of Chicago, Patagonia Sor Pat Patagonia Sor Titan, sorry. Patagonia Titan, sorry. 
the, their names are either Thor's or Titan, right? right? Saltasaurus. Uh, Argentinosaurus is the most, uh, well, considered by many to be the largest of the dinosaur, uh, dinosaurs in period, much less uh, Titanosaurus. And of course, I, I forgot the guy that's named just now. I don't know why. I'm so excited about this toy. <laughs> I forgot the African species named Peril of Titan. I, I knew that already, but yeah, I forgot it. As far as your Jurassic World connection, the only dinosaur that we know is related to it is the, and I did a video on this one already, the Ampliosaurus. So here's the Ampliosaurus, the small, the actual model. It's these guys. Here's one that fits this guy. The Titanosaurus. Uh, what they're known for, basically, is they have, uh, many of them have armor plating in their skin, which is often, which is made famous by the Saltosaurus. These little bumps you've seen here are football sized. Uh, bone pieces and what's really neat about that is we don't see well, let me think before I say that We don't think we I don't think we see a lot of in We don't see any in swords in the southern hemisphere I mean, there's there's a min Mai in Australia and you know, I think a couple here It's not recently in South America, but initially with the fine armor plating in South America It was assumed to be an ankylosaurus or you know, the, the, the Thyria fora the armor dinosaurs, Stegosaurus and ankylosaurus But it turns out these sauropods were going armor so you'll see some of the models like these guys here have armor and some don't so the idea is that we don't always fight it But it's something we see in the group and that bear in mind in the world of Titanosaur There are several like subgroups and so you know, so they're just like all dinosaur groups. They're broken down by many different characteristics uh, Most of which I can't go over right now because of time. I have to do a video just on uh, on Titanosaurs, but Jornatus itself uh, What makes it special and unique is they how much of it they found because with Argentinosaurus, for example, uh, there's a lot of vertebra they find and a part of a femur. But this one they found most of the tail, you know, most like here, they found this leg from the side of that leg, the lower part of this leg. I don't think they found this leg. A few vertebra, maybe two ribs, and they like that. They didn't find a skull. And that's like, like the part, the tip of the nose, well, actually, the, they found that part. So the big deal with this one. And why it's so important to paleontology is that they find both the humerus, the upper arm bone, and the femur. And with that, they can actually measure and extrapolate the uh, the, the size of the animal. Well, you say, how do you do that? Well, those bones are the ones that carry, you know, like for your tibia and your fibula, and then your ulna radius are two bones splitting the weight. You know, one, one has more than the other. But these two bones are carrying the full force of the animal. So using the circumference of that, they measure around that. They can calculate how much the animal must have weighed, how much it moves. Whereas with Argentinosaurus, its cousin, they have a lot of vertebra, uh, a partial femur, other bones too, but they don't have enough to make that, you know, if this is the first Titanosaur that I'm aware of, that have both those bones to base it on, right? Even the one in, uh, stuff in the Field Museum of Chicago, Pat Patagonia uh, Titan, that one doesn't have those, all those parts, right? So that's why it's such a big animal. And, well, we know it's such a big and heavy animal. As far as the feet go, I'm not, we have found a few Titanosaur feet, and I'm going to go ahead and compare it to its cousin, its closer cousin, the Brachiosaurus. Now, one thing to point out about Brachiosaurus is that we find, between Brachiosaurus and Giraffe Titan, we find uh, Brachiosaurus being North America, Giraffe Titan being in Tanzania, that the feet are like very much like this. But, you know, that's pretty accurate here. The back feet have been four toes like that. Uh, and again, the macronaria, it's macro meaning big. Naria is that whole, like you have a nar, your nose hole right here in your skull. Theirs is usually over their, uh, over their, between their eyes, over their head like this. So they have really big nose holes on macro naria, right? So where Brachiosaurus is literally means arm lizard, so his arms are longer than his legs. So therefore, it's designed to feed high, basically, right? It's their cousin, their further related cousin. I like that. It is uh, the Jurassic World of Patasaurus. So the Apatosaurus, I didn't much permission in the Apatosaurus video, but the feet are incorrect because you're seeing five clawed feet. Uh, the idea is that the diplodic, this, these are in the dipl, either people say diplodocid or diplodocid group, and they often will have like they diplodocus, for example, has metatars, metacarpals. They have the phalange. They are lacking the, so those two extra bends in your finger. They don't have that. They just have like this. Now they deal with a spike on the on the on the middle. The middle toe, uh, to maybe dig, dig for water or something, or maybe fight or grab, grab while mating, but we're not sure. But this guy doesn't actually show that. And the back feet usually have, uh, usually don't have enough, might have, this one has five toes, so it's like five toes and claws, and the plugs have like three, and another two don't have claws on them. So that's something that, uh, out of all of these, 
this is the least, the least accurate. Uh, but I'll just tell you from personal experience, I am super excited about these guys. Uh, they, I've, al I've always wanted giant sauropods in my collection. And, you know, growing up in, in, you know, in the last century, they just didn't have those options. And so now we have them. Honestly, in some ways, some of these toys are slightly too big compared to their relatives and counterparts in the, in the, in the dinosaur world. And they are really eating up space in my office here. <laughs> but the idea is that this animal, the titanosaur feet, match more with the brachiosaurus. So these look like they'll probably more be like, there's four toes and then there's five or four, five on the forelimb. So that's not entirely off the, off the record. But as far as taphonomy, when the animal died, the idea is that they, the reason they found mainly the most of the body and not the, uh, the hind section is because it's, uh, the theory or the hypothesis that it may have uh, died near a river. It, well, first of all, the sediment around it, because a long time ago, early paleontologists didn't understand, like the geology wasn't really fully understood, so they just did it out of the ground, put it on display. Nowadays, we look at the, the area it's in, the, the sediment around it, all these things. It was a fluvial system, and fluvial means river, basically. So it's water system. So the animal is, this is why in the movie, they're, uh, they show that these guys and they're always near around water. I'm not sure if the, the, the writers or the, they knew that or they just, you know, but um, that was kind of cool. You know, that, that, but a lot to unpack there. But the point is that if they're, they're hinting at water life, lifestyle where we know most, like sauropods don't live in the water. That was one of the earlier theories. The idea of thinking that, oh, they're so massive, they can't hold themselves up, so they need to have water for buoyancy. And then we realize we find their footprints in all these, like, hard areas or, like, lime muds and stuff, and not necessarily so that they're, they're submerged constantly. Uh, and even then, being found in water doesn't mean they always lived in the water, it just may have died in their water. So we know that elephants, for example, or many large animals, will go die in their water, and we're not sure why. But the idea is that it most likely seems that the neck may have been closer to the water source because it may have been washed away. Um, where this one, this part of the body is has a lot of, you know, they found this part. And, well, they found most of the body, actually, and like over like 100, you know, like vertebrae in the tail. So this area is more more preserved than this area. This must mean that it was washed away because if you look at the little, the, the diagram for the skeleton, you'll see like this two ribs, like a vertebra, tip of the nose, and then like most of this. So that tells you that it most likely was there, but it was scavenged. There were, there were probably bite marks on it. So... It was scavenged, but it wasn't like with um, there's some apatosaurus remains that have been found and what appeared to be like an allosaurus nest where they're ripping the animal apart and pulling it to some side or something. Uh, it was still pretty intact. So the name Dronatus, if you, I, I mentioned it before, means to fear nothing. Uh, during the, I think it was World War One, they took in the battleships and the battleships were made of metal and they had these all these cannons and guns and they were called Dreadnought class and they were like, they didn't fear anything. So the idea is something this large, you didn't fear anything. And... For many sauropods, again, their eggs are all like this size. They're the size of a soccer ball. So from birth to like sub-adult, you're in danger because either the predators are either your size or close. But once you get to a certain size and you're not injured, you you're just you have a good, a good you're pretty good. You're doing well until you start getting older. So there's a good solid period of your life where you're just this giant animal that they can't really harm. And then you know, so that's why it's called dreadnoughtus because it doesn't dread anything. It's not afraid of anything. Uh, and again, it is uh, the first of the giant titanosaur toys because you're seeing here, I mentioned this in my last video, he's like a prion. A lot of times the toy makers, I think they're not sure how a toy will sell, so they'll make it small. Because regardless of anything, any, new, any newer discoveries, Argentinosaurus is considered to be one of the largest animals of all time. And I only find this one, and there's one like uh, Marshalls or, you know, Roth, I find that's like a little bit bigger, uh, like this much bigger. So... Clearly, they're not, you know, they're not sure about what to do, the toy makers. Like, they're not sure about making a big model that's really expensive and kids not buy it, right? Uh, but that, because even this one here, the Patagonia Titan, and, you know, these are all some of the largest animals ever live, and they're all the smallest toys in my collection almost. So, uh, I'm not sure why, but like I said, for me, that's why I encourage people to buy certain things because, if, you know, the market speaks, and if people are buying these giant sauropods and they're buying a lot of these little ones, they're probably saying, hey, make a big sauropod, you know, because they're sauropods. That's the whole thing. They're giant things that walk around the earth and shake the ground sometimes, possibly. Although they may not have. They have, oh, last fun fact. So, uh, elephants, for example, they walk under, actually most animals are what we call digigrade. So we as humans are pentagrade. Our heels are on the ground, but primates are like that. But 
sauropods we, and even hadrosaur duckbills are, are like elephants. They walk on their toes. So there's a, there's a large pad back there from the walk on. So they may not have been constantly boom, boom, you know, like that kind of thing. That would have been, you know. But the idea still is that, I mean, they, they were still heavy, large animals. And I am super excited about this figure. This makes me very happy. I'm only second happy because the, the Brachiosaurus is like my favorite dinosaur. And that's a nostalgia thing there for me. The first Jurassic Park, but this guy was like a gift that came out of nowhere. It was like wow, and it's just so cool. And look at that, the nostrils. Yep. So the nostrils that you're gonna see here. Now it's something that, scientifically speaking, is questionable. Although we didn't find a part of the skull, you can see the nostrils are like right there. And then they're essentially right there above the eyes. Uh, research from Lars Whitmer, like Whitmer, in his lab, Whitmer Labs, who I follow on Instagram. Even though the nape nose hole is here, he suggests in his writings that there is soft tissue in his papers that there is, the nostrils would have been in the front on the, on the surf, on the skin. Like you would have seen a hole right here. Even though the hole in the skull is up here, the tubes would have brought it to that point, to that point there. He said, why? Because as he points out in his, his paper, like, you know, animals, they sniff nose spores, like pigs and dogs and all that. So how, why have your nostrils up here? You're going to be smelling for food, smelling for things. So even though the holes up there migrated up, the nostrils have been down there. So that's something that I would say is not correct, but I understand the toy makers didn't know that because for the last, for a while, we were like, put it up there. And I was like, put it down there. So it's been changing a lot. So, but the nose hole, the nars is up there between the, the eye holes here, the orbit, the nars is right there. But yeah, you know, that's, that's a little bit, that, that may be correct. But overall, still a great model, still a great figure, still something that I might want a second one. Oh, the neck rotates here too as well. The neck there is a solid. It goes up and right, go up and down. It can probably it doesn't lay down very well. The legs don't go far back or far forward. That's not cool. Okay, but it's so meaty. And of course, the tail. That's what the most interesting thing to me, and actually myself, is that other than a femur measurement thing, is that they found so many of the tail vertebra. And at the and going down from here, um, you know, on the on the tail, there's bumps going up, bones going up. What's called neural spines. The ones going on are called chevrons, and the chevrons, you come to a tapered point, they get to like a V-shape, but the, but the bottom of its tail has like this kind of like, after the V-point, it starts going narrow like other sauropods, it's wide again. And the idea there is that it has more muscle attachments, right? Remember, the skeleton is a, it's a, it's a port for the animal, but also the skeleton is where all the muscles attach and pull and push from. So that means it can move its tail like really well, you know, big muscular heavy tail. And if you're wondering about that, uh, the guy who discovered it has a video where he got a free, I think they sent him one from Mattel, or he opens it up and he reviews it as well. And he talks about more about the actual level skeleton and anatomy. I'll put a link below. But uh, but the idea is that uh, he approved it too. So there you go. The guy who found it approved it. Well, he could be very biased. But the guy who found it approved it, there you go. So with that being said, I'm calling this video to a close and thanking you for tuning in. And go get your Dreadnoughtus. Uh, the next couple of videos are going to be um, not Jurassic World figures, so we focus, focus more on other paleontology things. So stay tuned, look forward to those things.